Yeah. All go. All done? Yes. Set. Set. Okay. Dr. Boya. Yes. Please tell me. Till what time should we continue or I have to stop at 8 30 sharp? No, no, no. One hour. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah, one hour. On a little closer observation, you are bound to find that most of our cognitive processes, most of our actions are governed by insecurity, by fear. Whether that insecurity is a physical insecurity or an emotional insecurity or a social insecurity, <coughs> no matter what, even when you are going to push your children, go get good marks because you need to get good jobs you need to do bigger businesses. There is a fear that if you don't, then it will be difficult for you to survive. And therefore you better push yourself now. So there is insecurity even when you are trying to keep your relations, there you find that I should not be rejected or the person whom I love and adore so much. Am I audible to you all? Not there? Do I have to stop? Mahadev, Mahadev. I suppose it's okay. Yeah? The problem is not there, the problem is here. Let my throat get really warmed up. Mahadev. 
Mahadev. This is okay? Yes. Better. <laughs> yes. So you say. Yeah. Whether it is your relations or whether it is your profession, better, yeah. you connecting to the world or your connection with the world seems to be controlled through fear. It was very surprising few years ago. I was attending to one Mahatma who was admitted in a hospital in Mumbai. And this hospital is very well equipped and run by a Muslim foundation charity. And I had to stay in the hospital most of the time. So even the food, I had to go down to the canteen for tea, coffee or breakfasts. The doctor who was taking care would very often take me along and gather his friends over there to have tea over a cup of tea, some discussion over a cup of tea. There happened to be a doctor who, have, who was from the same hospital, from a different religious background. And, you know, when you are all together, different communities, you just discuss certain areas which are safer for discussion. Because in that half an hour, why do you want to rage a storm over there? some talk weather, talk about politics, talk about a few things which are not really very important. And they were talking about something like education. It's okay, everybody is talking. We are having a cup of tea. This person said that a religious person is he who has fear of God. An educated person is he, a cultured person is he who has fear of God. So even your relationship to the God seems to have got developed out of fear. I told him in the Upanishad, Taitariya Upanishad, it comes, Abhayam Pratishtham Vindate. The one who is enlightened, the knower of the self, is free from fear. All together, which means fear is not something that controls, governs his cognitive processes. Fear, insecurity is not something that controls his relationship with the world. But here you have got people who are saying that you should have fear and only when you have fear of God are you cultured. Will you be controlled? This is a very primitive psychology. You are afraid of something that seems to be unknown. That is why you enter an area which is dark and you are bound to feel fear. Because that area is dark, it is, what is there is not known to you. And therefore that unknown causes the fear. That what is unknown will always control and control you through fear. If something is known, then it no longer remains a factor which can be intimidating. 
which can cause fear. Your future is unknown to you and therefore you are anxious about your future. That anxiety about your future is a form of insecurity. And that's why people run to astrologers because they want to know what's going to happen. And if you know something over there, then your anxiety is reduced, your fear is reduced. Whether you love someone or you hate someone, even those relationships are also controlled by fear. If you love someone, you are afraid that this person should not stop loving me. He should not or she should not distance from me emotionally. He should just keep the same intensity of attachment and affection for me all through. If that does not happen, or if he goes away, or if he gives it to someone else, I am afraid there is fear. Therefore, your relationship of love is also controlled by fear. Obviously, that what you hate is something that intimidates you, something that causes fear. The theologians have gone so far that they are saying that even your relationship with God is also out of fear. They quote profusely and they say, be afraid of this God. Be afraid of this God because this God may punish you. If you are not going to be obedient and if you are not going to be good by the standards that God has set, this God has a wrath and he is going to be very revengeful. He is going to punish you for that. There is fear. So you find that fear controls you almost in all the spheres of life. It has cornered you. What you are afraid of at a particular point of time is irrelevant, but the thing is that, that you are. What may be the cause of your anxiety when you are in your teenage could be very much different from the cause of anxiety when you reach 40s. But it means that he, there is insecurity. A child who has just started going to the school is afraid of the school teacher because he has not done the homework. A teenager is afraid that somebody should not report to his parents back home what he has been doing outside. Gul <laughs> You are afraid that professionally your secret should not be revealed to your competitors. If you are working, you are afraid that your subordinate should not step over your head and go ahead. In a family, you are afraid that is how they express their anxiety and fear. They ask the small child, actually those mother and father, are also trying to get little security from that small child. They keep on asking, tell me baby, whom do you love more, mama or papa? <laughs> uh, it has got nothing to do with the child, it is their fear. Whom does he like more? And then if he says mama, she looks at father. <laughs> I'm victorious, you look. <coughs> <coughs> no. 
All these days you have been bossing around, but I have one final. Do you see that? And that has begun when the child just had started saying Mama and Papa. Both of them are. Look at that. Where do you have any freedom? Where do you have freedom even to breathe without fear? What? What a proportion of imbalance is this? All your life you are struggling to be free of this insecurity. And what seems to be chasing you, like the Brahmastra, is this insecurity. Have you heard that story or not? Just a story. It is. It reminds me of that story because we are talking about this Brahmastra. During the days of exile, on one hot afternoon, Bhagwan Ram is resting his head in Sitaji's lap and he is fast asleep. Indra's son, Jayanta, you've heard the story. Jayanta sees that there is Bhagwan Ram and this is Sita and they all say that he is Bhagwan, he is Bhagwan, he is Bhagwan. They look like ordinary forest dwellers. He is tired and resting in her lap. It looks like any forest couple. He says that I am going to test you. And he goes over there and he pecks Sita. He, he uh, takes a form of a crow and goes and pecks Sita. Her, there is some blood that oozes out of her body. And when those drops of blood trickle down to Rama, he wakes up to find that what is it that is so wet and warm. And Sita ji has not said a word because she doesn't want Rama to wake up. The crow kept on baking, but she doesn't move much. She doesn't even try to whisk it away. Rama wakes up and sees that there is a wound caused by this bird to Sita and he knows who it is. He simply picks up a blade of grass and darts it towards the crow. That blade of grass becomes a Brahmastra and it chases the crow chases Jayanta, who is in the form of that crow. Jayanta goes to every place. He goes to Kailas and he goes to Brahmaloka and he goes to Indraloka. He goes to every possible place. But that Brahmastra keeps on chasing him. It was possible that that Brahmastra would have had burnt him down. But it did not touch him, just kept him going. Till he finally comes to Sita ji and says, save me mother, I am sorry. And she says, don't worry. The crow, that Jayanta is so afraid, even when he falls at her feet, she says, Rama will protect you. But he is so afraid that he keeps his head turning backwards and does not look at Rama. So she lifts the bird and turns his gaze towards Rama. And the story says the Brahmastra disappears. It may be a little strange to you because how could birds talk and how could birds fly to Brahma Loka, Indra Loka? We don't even know whether that Svarga Loka exists or not. That is irrelevant. Those are not the issues to be discussed over here, whether there are those Deva Lokas or not. The thing that you should know is 
that fear which was constantly chasing him even even if he reached the highest places which an, for an ordinary mortal it is impossible to imagine he goes to those places perhaps those are the highest achievements of a mortal you are significantly influenced by small little achievements over here if you are chosen as a leader of a small little committee here you are as if i am alexander the great you stand on a little place you have a little small little house cozy very beautiful and then there your chest is who is there kosti sadrushomaya who is there is there any parallel to me equivalent to me jayanta has gone there those things which perhaps are not one cannot even imagine an entry into brahma lok and entry into the swarga lok kailash lok and yet he is not able to make himself free of that fear finally the story says that having turned his gaze to rama the brahmastra also disappears and the fear also disappears you could come from the highest lineage indra's son indra happens to be the king of devatas this is his son so whether those are your family backgrounds whether those are your personal achievements nothing is able to set you free of the fear everything over here seems to be controlled and governed by your fear and there is only one place where this fear can totally be eradicated you can try hard as much as you want to be free from insecurity but that insecurity doesn't seem to go somebody is going to say that i will feel secure if i have sufficient money what is your definition of sufficient money to remove that insecurity please tell how much money is required for you to feel secure please tell i will feel secure if i have proper attention from my husband or wife or my children or my parents how much attention do you need to be free of this insecurity you tell let us quantify it and sooner you are going to find that no amount of this attention or money or popularity is good sufficient enough for you to feel secure what you are actually looking for is not security what you are looking for is freedom from insecurity because security is something that cannot be purchased because people are giving you attention because somebody gives me affection or because something something i will feel secure security does not come that way till then you remain as an insecure person struggling over here. Upanishad says that it is this knower of the self, knower of Brahman. He alone is established in that which is free from fear. Dvitiya dvay bhayam bhavati. a very famous upanishadic statement 
it says fear comes from the second from the other from the duality it is a very profound statement it needs to be explained it needs to be understood it is not a statement that you can simply use it anywhere like a shero shayari it is something to be understood about it there is something to be understood about it dvitiya anvaya bhayam bhavati and why i am bringing this again to you i am trying to give you different perspectives my attempt since two days is to give you this different perspectives what do you mean by imbalance what do you mean by a person who is imbalanced you may find yourself capable of conducting your transactions with the world and that's why you are saying that you are quite balanced i am able to talk to you and that's why i am balanced i am able to do few transactions with the world and that's why i am balanced i am able to calculate my profits and losses and that's why i am balanced but nobody over here will ever like to admit that there is something wrong with me nobody wants to admit that there is something wrong with me <clears throat> if nothing is wrong with you why are you afraid if nothing is wrong with you why do you go into phases of sadness what is it that throws you into this misery of an arm it swings you into the state of depression dejection feeling of rejection look at that you want to be happy but you are not free to be happy because something is always there which says that how can you be happy i can't be happy something is always there to prevent you have you ever seen something which is very peculiar in our society if the child is laughing too much they go over there the adults and say don't laugh so much you will have to cry in your future the child is happy the parents are all there they are jealous he is my child how can he be happy if he is my child the genetic problem has to be there he can't be so they go over there and say you can't be because the parents have stopped being happy everything that you do is wanting to be happy but you are not free to be happy there is always something sitting over there only if i have another car will i be happy only if my wife listens to me then will i be happy and he goes to the temple and prays that way don't think that only your husbands and wives are praying that way we have found such statements even in older books ancient books भार्यां मनोरमा देवी मनोवृत्तानुसारेण तारेण भव संसार सागरस्य कुलो भवान ऐ से लो देर चु दुर्गा ये दुर्गे भवान गिव मी अ वाइफ मनोरमा देवी हु विल बी वेरी प्लीजिंग टू माय हार्ट एंड manovritta anusari the most difficult thing he is asking and she should be also manovritta anusari she should be doing things according to what i want not oppose me 
Durga says, from where will I get such wife? Because even when Shankarji prevented me from going to Daksha's home, I went against his wish. Now where am I going to find one such? Oh, you are asking a very difficult. If he is praying for such a wife, then should you also not pray for one such husband? <laughs> Women are wise, they know they will never. Women don't pray, they make them do. <laughs> you know, back home in Rishikesh, on such occasions, I have declared and I have said it without any abasement. I said, I am a thorough feminist. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> imbalanced. You want to be happy, you can't be. You want to be f feel secure, you can't be. And that's why, look at it, all your psychology is just framed with this. It is an arrested psychology. It is an arrested psychology, as if you are a prisoner. And that is what the scriptures called as bondage. This is what is called as bondage. Bondage is not something, Oh Maharaj, please make us free from Bhavabandha, Bhavasagar, we are drowning in Bhavasagar. They keep on saying all these production cars also. This is it. This is the bondage, arrested. Coverted, controlled. You want to be, but you can't be. And when you can't be, instead of going for the right reason, you start blaming the world. If you have, if you are not married and you are teenagers, you will start blaming your parents and teachers. If you are in your middle age, you will start blaming your partners and the governments. And if you have nothing else, you will start blaming the planets. All of them. But then by blaming them, you find a little vent for your anger. Because it is not your fault. It is somebody else's fault that I am not happy. Let I'm feeling a little better by having blamed someone. Then you are going to hunt for victims. When you say that you love a person, you actually are looking for a victim whom you can blame. You were supposed to make me happy, but you haven't. So you are responsible if I'm sad. You are like an animal the beast of prey, prowling, looking for victims. Somebody to get angry at, if you cannot get angry at, you always will have your family to get angry at. You will, have, you will always find someone to blame. Someone to say that you are dissatisfied because of something. And even if you do so, you still are not free. Even after having blamed, you find that you are still seething with anger. You still are carrying the feeling of rejection and guilt. You are not free. How are you going to? Don't you see that this is a state of imbalance? It is imbalance because you want to be free, but you can't be. You want to be secure, but you can't be. You want to be happy, but you can't be. 
and there is something that constantly makes you afraid. There is something that makes you insecure, there is something, something present which is always there, which is going to be a thorn in the flesh. Something of the other. It is not Nishkantakam. You could be Alexander the Great and still you will have someone or something which is like a thorn stuck in the flesh. And that's why this is imbalance. How are you going to be free from this fear, from this insecurity, from all this? Because this is the question. You want to be free. And this question of freedom is question of moksha. The word moksha means liberation. Moksha means freedom. Therefore, we cannot say moksha is equivalent to salvation. There is nothing like salvation over here. Some of the books that you are going to read are going to say moksha means salvation. Salvation means you have to wait for somebody to come and save you. Then you are going to say someone is still not coming. And if he is not coming to save me, I don't know how long I have to wait and suffer till he arrives. Because his coming to save me is something that is totally dependent on that person or that entity. It is salvation. But we don't have this idea of salvation. What you have is liberation, moksha, freedom. It is not liberty, it is liberation. Because when you are going to talk about liberty, you can have liberty of speech, liberty of action, liberty of movement, liberty of the press, of the media. Here is the question of liberation, of freedom. Now comes a question, freedom from what? Freedom from all this. And when you have found a way, when you have found that freedom, that state is your natural state. Because that is what you are asking for. Have you ever seen a rubber band? A rubber band can get stretched. But the stretched rubber band is not its natural state. It is wanting to return back to its own state. If you want to be free, that is not something unnatural to you because you want to go back to your own natural state. It is something natural to you. And therefore this Icha, Moksha Icha, this desire to be liberated is most natural to each one of you. In fact, that is your real desire. To what extent are you able to recognize your real need? Will depend upon how aware are you in your daily transactions. It will depend upon you how well are you able to undergo various experiences of life. It is not that you require certain experiences in life to become right. Whatever experiences are coming to you your way are sufficient enough to teach you. Though they are sufficient when you refuse to learn from them, 
then that experience which had come is a failure. Whether that experience is an experience of joy or sorrow, whether that experience is an experience of appreciation or rejection, whether that experience is an experience of loss or profit, irrelevant. Whatever that experience is, what have you understood and what have you learned from it? If you refuse to learn from your own experiences, who is going to teach you? Even Brahaspati comes down, he will be a failure. Even if Brahma, Chaturmukha Brahma, with all his four mouths, he tries to teach you, nothing happens to you because you are immune. You keep on talking, I don't want to pay attention. I'm not going to learn from you. Any experience of yours is a successful experience if you have learned from it. And the moment you learn, you understand something from an experience, you will become free from those experiences. It's like going to this school and you will keep on repeating this same grade as long as you don't pass. You will be sitting in the same class because whatever was being taught in that class, in that grade, you have refused to understand. And that's why you continue to sit over there as long as you don't understand. It is not 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or 60 years which is going to guarantee you the maturity of life. Maturity means how well have you understood whatever experience that you have undergone. It does not require that you, requ you have to have some extraordinary experience. A lot of the spiritual teaching goes that unless and until you have an extraordinary experience, out of the world experience, not required. You learn, you understand, you will be free. If the situations are repeating in your life, which means you are caught up in a loop, if the same things keep on irritating you, which means you are caught up, that whatever was irritating you, you didn't understand what it is and therefore you will keep on getting irritated every time, again and again, again and again, again and again. Because you don't understand, you don't learn. But then you are going to blame somebody else. How many times I have told you not to wear this color sari, it irritates me. You understand what is it about this color that irritates you. The moment you understand you will be free. There will be a relative freedom. I'm, I'm talking to you about absolute freedom, but there will be relative freedom too. You will find your space wherein the situations outside could have been irritating you earlier. But now you have found your space in which those situations do not disturb you. Because you have understood. Once that is done, then those situations will not repeat. Then those things will not repeat again because you have moved. We have failed and that's why we sit over there. Don't wait for some extraordinary experiences to take place. You have to have God realization and listen until the hope. Some God, some Chaturguj, Shankha Chakrakata, Padma Garudavahan Bhagavan, and listen until the Shabhavan, whosoever appears in front of me. 
and then you will have some people who are going to use this desperateness of yours. And they are going to tell you that we are going to give you an extraordinary experience. An extraordinary experience. You don't require it. And you are also demanding an extraordinary experience because you are bored with your life. A lot of the spiritualists you are going to find that they are thoroughly bored. And that's why they are saying that we want to see angels and we want to see some lights and we want to see all these heavenly creatures hovering around. Because they are not happy seeing ordinary people move around. They are not happy seeing the birds flying around. Now they want some different cherubs and different angels flying around. We want to see some light. You better watch the signal lights. He can't see those signal lights properly. He want to see some special lights. What? Out of the world, there was one boy. He goes to that girl and says, Sweetheart, just say those three words. Just say those three words which will take me out of this world. Which will take me out of this world, she says. Go hang yourself. <laughs> three words and you will be immediately out of this world. Stop being silly. Ask closely what is it that you want. Your innate, intimate desire is desire for freedom. Even when you are seeking pleasures, you are seeking freedom. One of my teachers puts it very beautifully. He says, when you are seeking pleasure, you are actually seeking freedom from your displeased self. You want entertainment, which means you are sufficiently bored with yourself. Because you don't find anything interesting about yourself, you need entertainment. And therefore that society which has got highest form of entertainment, you can understand that the society is thoroughly bored. They do not find anything interesting. They have to make life spiced up. They have to create an entertainment for themselves. Isn't it very sad? You can very well survive without entertainers. But you cannot survive without the farmer. In an agrarian society, whether it is an agrarian society like Indian economy, or it could be any advanced society, where you have your tertiary jobs most important. The farmer remains most important. But the one who is most ignored, most neglected, most looked down upon is the farmer. And the people who are most worshipped, admired, paid, are the entertainers. You can understand why so much importance, because the society people over here are sick. They are bored. They don't find sufficient adventure in their living. 
they need to feel identified for those two hours with the hero of that story. Because when you are watching the movie, you are not watching the hero, you are actually seeing that is your story, you are the hero over there. It gives you a little time to feel that how heroic you are. Because ordinarily, nobody is even going to, not even a mosquito really pays attention to you. To hours of your life, you would find that it is not sufficiently interesting. And therefore, you have to create something that is going to make it spiced up, going to make it interesting. And therefore, a society in which entertainers occupy the most important position, you can understand the psychology of that society. In the Indian culture, I'm not talking to you because I want you to feel very proud about Indian culture. I'm just talking to you about sanity, balance. The person who is most admired, who is on the top rung of ladder, is Sthita Prashna, is a man of realization, is the enlightened one. not an entertainer, a person who has discovered his being, he who has discovered that freedom from fear, he stands on the top of the ladder. He shines over there like a temple on a mountain top. Not an entertainer. But today the irony is that Indian film industry is equally challenging and big as Western film industry. I am not against any profession. I am simply saying, look at it. I am not saying that entertainment should be eliminated from society. I am not at all against anything. If you have to ask me what is it that I am against, I am against only one thing and that is ignorance. Not knowing. What else knowledge means going to oppose? Knowledge will oppose only ignorance. Knowledge does not oppose any social systems. Social Norms, positions, knowledge is opposed to ignorance, to foolishness, to errors. Because when there is knowledge, error is not there. When there is knowledge, ignorance is not there. When there is light, darkness is not there. Knowledge does not oppose anything except for ignorance. This freedom, freedom from insecurity, freedom from misery, suffering, that what you actually are seeking when you start appreciating that this is what I really want, your psychology naturally starts coming to a balance. Now you will not start blaming people around you. When you are not going to blame people around you, your relations will naturally become amicable which means that the person has become mature enough to handle his own emotions as well as the emotions of others. The person becomes capable of seeing that there is irritation, there is anger, there is frustration, there is sense of rejection, 
he is able to handle it. When you are able to handle those emotions of yours, you have become a master. You have become mature. This maturity now is what your balance is. If having undergone various experiences, if you are not able to learn how to do this, my question is, having lived a life of 30, 40, 50, 60 years, what did you learn? What did you learn? You learned only how to cheat others. You learned how to irritate others. You have learned only how to be irritated by others. What did you learn? You are going to say that I have not aged just by sitting in the sun outside. In Hindi, I say that I don't have to eat my hair. You know, I don't have to eat my hair. Which means I have undergone experiences. And that is what has given me 60 years of life. Sir, 60 years of life, what have you learned? What did you learn? And therefore, if you have not learned, if you have not understood, at the end of your life, you are still going to say, whatever number of days I have lived was insufficient. I have still not got what I wanted. You started your life with a great expectation that you are going to make it. But when you hit the pillow, you don't have to wait for the last day of your life. Just observe when you hit the pillow before you sleep. Are you saying that you are happy with the day that has gone? If that is there, you are fine. You have made it. You have learned, you have gained, you have matured, you have grown. If this growth does not happen, you are thwarted, dwarfed. What is it that they say? the trees which are grown in the pots. Huh? Where the big, huh? the Japanese art of growth. Bon you are bonsai. You are bonsai. You appear to have grown, but you haven't. And that's why you are going to find that a person is 60 year old, small child. He can't. Friends, understand what is it that you really are seeking. And that freedom which you are seeking, that freedom means moksha. Vedanta is that moksha shastra which reveals to you, gives to you that what you are seeking. And therefore, having come to this, there is nothing more to be sought, nothing more to be gained. And therefore, he who knows it, that what the Shastra is wanting to show you, the Shastra says, he will become free of fear. Nothing can threaten you. Even the deluge of these three worlds cannot threaten you. The pralaya kala also cannot threaten you. Kala is time and time is a threat. Don't you see time is threatening you? If you don't believe, just stand in front of the mirror and you will know how time threatens you.
and if you are too young for the mirror to tell you that just observe how you are anxious what will happen tomorrow all my friends are getting good admissions and good jobs i don't know what i'm going to do will i be able to make it will i be able to do it will i be able to prove myself will i be able to survive in this competition in this world the time is already threatening you bhagwan shiva is called as mrityunjay the one who is victorious over time the one who has trampled the time under his feet that is the man of realization he who has awakened he who has known that what the shruti is telling showing such a person tramples that fear tramples the time under his feet he is mrityunjaya this is that vedanta shastra therefore i am saying i am not going to give you any tricks to tell you how to balance your mind i am not going to tell you count ships and start counting backwards from 100 when you are angry all such gimmicks don't work because they do not address the fundamental problem it may give a temporary relief next time you are going to be angry you may start counting backwards it may work for few more days but next time when it, you are angry counting backwards itself will irritate you more <laughs> so that what you have purchased as a solution will even become another problem look at it friends understand what is that one is seeking just in appreciating what you are seeking you already start moving gravitating towards that center towards the fulcrum fulcrum of balance you will be a balanced person your emotions will not be running haywire your mind will not be constantly conflicting you will stand as a pillar of peace even for the world outside the whole world can be moving in a storm but you will stand as a pillar of peace just in recognizing what you want and having got it there is no question about it what is that that shruti wants to show you let us see that in brief tomorrow ओम पूर्णमत पूर्णमी पूर्णा पूर्णमुदच्य पूर्ण से पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवशिष्य ओं शांत शांत शांति Sir, buddy, enjoy night dinner, and if anyone not coming tomorrow, uh, please take prasadam from the room. Uh, uh, offer any good dashna, there's a wallet waiting. Thank you.